Hello friends, welcome to Zoom in China. In a previous episode, we talked about the assassination attempts against top CCP officials such as Deng Xiaoping, Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping, etc. After that episode, some viewers wanted another episode about the assassination against Mao Zedong. Today, we will talk about a suspicious case of assassination attempt on Mao Zedong in Tiananmen Square that happened in 1950. August 17, 1951, on an ordinary day, two foreigners were executed in Beijing. One was Italian, Antonio Riva, and the other was Japanese, Yamaguchi Ryuichi. They were charged for shelling Tiananmen Square and assassinating Mao and other Chinese communist leaders. The following day, the front page of the People's Daily published a report on this, along with the full text of the verdict by Beijing Military Control Commission of the People's Liberation Army. On the fourth page of the same day, the full text of Beijing Public Prosecutor's Office Indictment Against U.S. Agents and Spies for Conspiracy to Violently Destroy People's Republic of China was published. On the third page, Evidence of U.S. Agents and Spies Conspiracy to Insurrection was published. From the severity of the official reports, it was clear that this case was a shocking case in the eyes of the CCP. According to the Chinese Communist Party, the Italian Antonio Riva was a devoted fascist. After the end of World War II, he joined the U.S. Strategic Intelligence Agency in 1946 and received an assignment to infiltrate Beijing in 1949. They were equipped with espionage tools, weapons, and ammunition and were asked to seek the opportunities to engage in assassination activities. In January 1950, Antonio Riva and a group of international spies, including Yamaguchi Ryuichi, Henry Vetch, and other spies, conspired to assassinate Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, and other communist leaders by shelling Tiananmen Square with a mortar during the Communist Party's National Day celebrations. Two of them were executed, and the rest were sentenced to life imprisonment. The case shook the whole country and startled the entire world. It also strengthened Chinese people's hatred against foreign countries. However, many people believe that this case was highly suspicious and was probably concocted by the Chinese Communist Party to threaten the Western countries. Because of the complex domestic and international environment in which the CCP found itself at that time, there were many voices of a dissidents domestically and internationally. The CCP was considered a hostile country by the West because it built up relationships with Soviet Union and supported the North Korean invaders. As a result, the CCP took strict action against anyone it suspected of being an enemy, and those Westerners in China were the first to be targeted. In the book, The Forgotten Gulag, China's Hidden Prison Camps, written by the famous French sinologist Jean-Luc Domenac and published in 1992, the author talked about this assassination on page 74 and 75, which is excerpted below. After October 1950, the atmosphere became increasingly tense, and a national security conference was held. The first priority was to suppress foreigners living in China and the Chinese people who had contacts with foreigners, and to give them some threat. The former people were considered as spies and the latter as traitors. A suspicious incident kicked off the attack a plot to assassinate Mao Zedong. After a flurry of activities, it was announced that six foreigners and one Chinese had been arrested on charges that they had been instructed by the CIA to plot the murder of Mao Zedong and other leaders by shelling the Tiananmen Square on October 1st, the Chinese National Day. In August 1951, six people were sentenced to severe punishment, including two sentenced to execution. Both were businessmen. One was Italian, Antonio Riva, and the other Japanese, Yamaguchi Ryuichi. This incident is still clouded with suspicion and puzzling. Not only was this case based on false files, fabricated evidence, and fictitious inferences, but it also involved a number of foreign cases that were similarly fabricated. In fact, it was the only case to date involving the murder of a Chinese leader since the founding of the PRC. The purpose at that time was to simply send a warning to Western countries. The Chinese government would adopt a policy of severe punishment for any hostile act. Bai Yang, an Italian journalist who graduated from the University of Rome with a degree in Chinese history and studied in China, 
conducted a thorough investigation and analysis of this case in the 1990s. As both a sinologist and the writer, he wrote a 240,000-word documentary, almost like a report on the investigation of the case, called Conspiracy on the Assassination of Mao. Baiyang said, To compose this book, I referred both Chinese and Italian sources, from official documents to articles written by journalists, from memoirs to interviews I conducted myself. I also consulted the archives of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Rome, which gave me the privilege of knowing the relations between Italy and China from the beginning of the 20th century until the 1950s. The book by General Silvio Scaroni, heir to the Lodi family, documented the activities of the Italian Air Force Instruction Corps in China. The testimonies written by Giuliano Bertuccelli, an Italian diplomat who later became professor of Chinese language at the University of Rome, and Ada Ziano's diary. These writings provided me with sources from another perspective. She added, I interviewed many people who lived in China at that time and read many memoirs written by missionaries, especially Father Fortuano Teberi. In his book, not only did he tell his days of torture in prison, but he also introduced me to the relationship between China and Vatican City and the Cardinal of Yixian County, Ma Di Ru. It is a pity that Vatican City did not open their archives to me. In addition, Baiyang interviewed one of Antonia Riva's sons, who introduced Baiyang to a book written by his aunt and Riva's sister-in-law, Bettina, in which Baiyang quoted Riva's son's description about Riva's sentence and execution. Apparently, Baiyang's book was full of questions about Riva's death. So, what exactly is the suspicious point of Riva's case? A web article titled, A Strange Case About Spy Riot, written by Cheng Ziyun, provided some analysis, which are summarized as below. First, the caliber of the mortar allegedly used to shell Tiananmen Square, which was recovered from Riva's home and made public by the Chinese Communist Party, is inconsistent. The indictment of the Chinese Communist Party's persecutor's office that year stated that a 6-0 mortar was used in the conspiracy of armed insurrection, and it was seized from Riva's residence. The list of physical evidence seized attached to the indictment also clearly states that a plan drawn by Yamaguchi Ryoichi about the shooting of Tiananmen, a 6-0 mortar. In other words, Riva attempted to murder Mao and others with a 60mm caliber mortar. However, in recent years, Official Chinese communist newspapers, magazines, and books have talked about the 80 caliber mortar used for shelling. For example, the Beijing Municipal Public Security Bureau's A Record of the Conspiracy to Shell Tiananmen, published in September 1990 by the Beijing Literature and Arts Publishing House, states, this is an 82 mortar shell. Why would the Beijing Public Security Bureau, which has all the files archived, make such mistake? Additionally, there was an article titled The Truth About the Shelling of Tiananmen 54 Years Ago, prepared by a reporter from the Legal Daily in July 2004 based on the classified documents from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It stated, at that time, the tool that the spies wanted to use to shell Tiananmen was an 82 caliber mortar. According to this foreign ministry file, the U.S. intelligent agent concealed this 82 caliber mortar in emergency supplies and gave it to Riva on the eve when the CCP first occupied Beijing. Why do the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Archives and the Legal Daily, which is under the Central Committee for Political and Legal Affairs, say the same thing? Cheng Ziyun, who was quite surprised, then consulted with a friend who was familiar with mortars about the photos published in People's Daily in August 1951. His friend told him that it was clearly an 82mm mortar, 1931 Republic of China model, adapted from the 81mm mortar of a French design in the 1930s. This design had a unique flat detached bipod. It was then modified to a flat leg by the Chinese military, and the caliber was changed to 82mm. No other country had such design. At that time, only China and the Soviet Union produced 82mm mortars. The question then arises, why did the American spy use a mortar made by the Chinese military? Where did he obtain them? And which is true between the 60mm mortar mentioned in the indictment and the 82 mortar that came later? Second, 
The accuracy of firing artillery shells from Riva's home to Tiananmen Square was not good. According to the Chinese Communist Party, Riva's plan was based on the orders given by Colonel Barrett, a veteran agent of the Allied Command Intelligence in Tokyo. On October 1st, when the Communist leaders stand on Tiananmen Square building, his plan was to fire three mortar shells from the courtyard of Riva's house to Tiananmen Square in the southwest direction. Cheng Ziyun's article points out that the advantage of mortars is that there are no blind spots for firing, which is advantageous for getting over the roof of Tiananmen and hitting the rostrum. However, the disadvantages are that the initial velocity of the shells are low, the flight time is long, so the accuracy is therefore low, and the point of impact scatters in a large area. According to the Soviet artillery tutorial, the 82 mortar had a 47 meter by 120 meter oval impact spread at a range of 1 kilometer. Therefore, all mortar firing tutorials emphasize test firing and impact point correction. At least two test firings are required. But Riva's residence, number 17, Gan Yu Hu Tong B, on the northeast of Tiananmen, was about 1800 meters to Tiananmen a distance at which the point of impact scatters even larger. Plus, there is no direct view to Tiananmen. Without on-site test firing and more than two impact point observation corrections, it would be almost impossible to hit a precise shot. Obviously, the Chinese Communist Party would answer this question by saying that Yamaguchi often went to Tiananmen to measure the terrain himself. However, since there were no modern instruments such as laser range finders, Yamaguchi could not blatantly take out a ruler to measure the area, and all he could do is take visual and step measurements. How accurate would that be? Under such conditions, are the US intelligence agency and spies that stupid to commit this assassination? It would be equal to committing suicide. Third, the Chinese official announced that the mortar parts were incomplete, there was no base plate, the tail of the mortar sat directly on the ground. In Cheng Ziyun's opinion, such mortars could still be fired, but there was absolutely nothing to talk about in terms of accuracy. In addition, from the fact that Riva himself admitted his conspiracy of the artillery attack, he did not need to conceal any base fleet. What was the purpose of American spies' reckless assassination of Mao without precise measurements and a mortar base plate that guarantees accuracy? Fourth, questions about the sketch of the bombardment of Tiananmen drawn by Yamaguchi. According to a record of the detection of conspiracy to shell Tiananmen, on September 18, 1950, an airmail envelope containing 10 letters was sent by Yamaguchi to Nisu Sagio Ko in Tokyo, Japan, all printed in English spelling Japanese phonetics. Among these letters was a draft drawing of a firing map of Tiananmen Square. This was thought to be the target of the artillery bombardment because the drawing had a straight arrow pointing to the center of Tiananmen Tower and depicted Mao standing in the center. However, as Cheng Ziyun's article points out, this drawing is worthless to the US intelligence agencies because, for one thing, the so-called artillery trajectory is simply unrealistic, as no one would set up a mortar in broad daylight on the Jinshui Bridge in Tiananmen, a place under strict security. For another reason, the position of Mao and others standing on Tiananmen is public information, and the US intelligence agencies do not need this diagram drawn by Yamaguchi. In particular, Yamaguchi's signature was left in the upper right corner of the diagram, which was obviously a wrong action for a professional spy. Yamaguchi's explanation for the drawing was that it was drawn to illustrate the function of the imported firefighting water pump and sent to Nisu Sagio in Tokyo as an additional explanation for the order. This explanation is logical, and to prove whether it's true, the Chinese Communist Party could have checked whether firefighting equipments were ever used in Tiananmen Square in the past. But unfortunately, there is no mention of this in the verdict. Fifth, the behavior of the so accused, Tarcisio Martina, who was the Beijing representative of Nuncio to China, was also inexplicable. According to the indictment, Tarcisio Martina, who was arrested in 1951, concealed 259 rounds of pistol bullets, rifle bullets, and mortar shells, 8 hand grenades, 273 pieces of artillery shell cases, primers, and weapon parts for Antonio Riva, as well as 6 original documents on the Chinese Communist Party's Siping Street Battle. Interestingly, 
Martina's arrest was more than seven months after Riva's arrest. In such a long time, Martina neither destroyed the documents nor transferred the concealed weapons, nor did he flee. Such a spy was rarely seen. Sixth, the number of shells was not clear. In this case, the key number of mortar shells was not there, but a general statement of 259 rounds of pistol bullets, rifle bullets, and mortar shells, etc. Why is the most important information, the number of mortar shells, not listed separately? In addition, on the photo of the material evidence published in People's Daily, you can see almost all the bullets and grenades, but only one mortar shell. Would it be believable for Riva to fire at Tiananmen Square with only one mortar shell? Seventh, the head of the U.S. Army spy in Tokyo, Colonel David Dean Barrett, who had been accused for directing the case, was actually exonerated by the Chinese Communist Party. The 1951 indictment mentions that Riva and others were directed to carry out the assassination by the headquarters of the U.S. occupation force in Tokyo, Japan, and also by Colonel David Dean Barrett, a former military attaché of the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. However, in an article by Li Yaoyu, the U.S. military observer group in Yan'an I Know, published in Thousand Weekend on February 19, 2004, it was written that in 1971, Zhou Enlai spoke with Xie Weisi, who was invited to visit China, and made it clear that it was a mistake to accuse Barrett of being involved in the Tiananmen Square shelling, and said that Barrett was welcome to visit China. On February 3, 1977, Barrett died in San Francisco at the age of 84 after a long illness. Li Yaoyu was the administrator of the Chinese Propaganda Department and the administrator of the U.S. Army Observation Group. He had close contacts with Barrett and the U.S. Army Observation Group in Yan'an. According to him, if the U.S. spy chief, Mr. Barrett, was not involved in the shelling plot, then there is only one possibility. Riva and the others acted without authorization. But why did they send a shelling map to Tokyo? And why did the Americans not rescue the spies, but simply deny the matter? With all these suspicious points, it is clear that this assassination of Mao was highly likely an injustice case directed by the CCP themselves. According to Xu Xiaodi in her book, The Years of Upside Down, her father was one of the investigators of the Tiananmen Square shelling case and was awarded a prize for his work. He was a person who maintained a gray status during the early years of the Communist Party, working according to the organization's instructions. His task was to collect information from diplomats and Kuomintang defectors. Xu Xiaodi's father was an early graduate of Liu Shun University of Law and Political Science, fluent in Japanese and English. He was also an underground Communist Party member, who, after 1949, was a registered cadre in the Ministry of Public Security, but often worked as an interpreter in diplomatic situations. Xu Xiaodi's mother, on the other hand, came from a wealthy family. Initially, her parents married out of love, but later divorced due to differences in philosophy and habits. During the Cultural Revolution, Xu Xiaodi's mother was criticized and struggled, and her father was also criticized and struggled under the label of Great Spy, and later imprisoned for seven years on charges of counter-revolutionary collaboration with foreign countries. This is another example of a man who served the Chinese Communist Party sincerely, but was eventually abandoned. And such tragic fates continue to plague the Chinese people until today. Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you for watching. If you like our program, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like and share our videos.